eight, third, fourth, fifth grade, junior high, you guys are dismissed back to your um, <clears throat> classrooms. I'm looking at the um, I'm I'm looking at your sermon guides, and uh, I'm excited about what God's given us. If you have your Bibles and you're going to follow along, we're going to be in a couple of different places. The first one that we're going to be in is Genesis 15. You can turn to that one. Uh, do we have any English teachers in the room? Anybody that teaches English? Got a couple? Okay. Uh, there's a there's a type of writing. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. Um, it's the most annoying type of writing ever invented. And it's called stream of thought. Anybody ever hear that? Or am I the only like deep like book nerd that understands what that is? Okay, I'll share with you. Um, stream of thought, basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, I think maybe a couple of hundred years ago, somebody that couldn't really write wanted to be a writer. And so he's like, I'll just invent this new type of writing. And it's where you, thank you. I thought that was funny too. I appreciate that. Um, this half didn't think it was funny, but you laughed enough for this half, so we'll call it good. Um, the stream of thought, basically what it is, is you just sit down and, and you just write whatever comes to mind. I mean, it, you go, well, that just sounds like journaling or writing a diary, but it's not that as much because you could go from talking about uh, what a great uh, fisherman you are, and then you could jump into your thoughts on politics. There's no rhyme or reason. It's just literally... Um, a jumbled mess of thoughts on a page bound and then given a really catchy title and sold to unsuspecting people. Can you tell that I have a little bit of, uh, that I've fallen prey to this tactic? Um, there's nothing more frustrating than a book that's like that because what I know about writing, and, and I'm not the world's best writer, um, but what I know is that writing needs to have parts, right? Every good story has a beginning, a hook. It catches you. It brings you in. It has a middle, right, where the, the story's built and it, it's explained and characters are developed and maybe a problem arises or an antagonist or a protagonist enters into the story. That was really cool English language for you people that don't understand it. All the English teachers are really impressed by what I'm saying right now. And then there's an ending, right? There's a conclusion where stuff, uh, problems uh, sometimes are resolved unless you're one of these writers that like to leave stuff hanging out or the cliffhanger. So then you got to buy the next book to see if that problem solved and they keep you going and on and on and on and on and on. Stream of thought is not like that. It's just whatever you want. Well, what I know is we've been studying the story of Moses over the last year is that it has been one of the greatest stories ever told. And there are really three main parts to this story of the Exodus as we, as we close out uh, our, our season following Moses and the people of Israel. And I know that some of you are thinking, man, it feels like we missed a lot. Uh, and and we, we intentionally, by design, didn't look at every verse of the story of Exodus because I do feel like it's important for, for you maybe to take a little bit of onus and ownership in, in, in understanding the full depth and nature and truth of the story. Uh, I, I saw recently uh, a, a little thing. You guys know what the number one question Jesus asked people? The number one question Jesus asked people is this, haven't you read? He, he's having conversation, and, and what he's doing is he's pointing them back to Scripture, and he's laying down for them the foundational importance of reading and knowing Scripture. And so as I give you like a very 10,000-foot view of the three main points of the story of Exodus, you have to understand that we didn't get to all of it. And if you want more of it, you've got to take this personal ownership to dive in and study the story even more. But as we get to the, this idea today that the story of Exodus has three main points, we find the first point way back in Genesis 15, and we actually talked about this a year ago, but let's read it. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If you didn't bring a Bible, it'll be on the screen. In verse uh, chapter 15, it says this, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And this is God's talking to Abraham, and he says, This person, this man, shall not be your heir, but your very own, un, uh, your own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards the heavens. 
and number the stars. If you were able to number them, then he said to them, so shall your offspring be, be. and he believes the Lord, and he counted it as righteousness. Now we're going to stop right there. I did a little research this week. Scientists estimate that in the known universe, there are 200 billion trillion stars. That's a number that's incalculable. We couldn't even, we can't even comprehend how many stars that actually is. And they didn't count them, but all they could do is they could estimate the number of galaxies measuring by measuring color and the brightness of starlight. And they estimate that there's something like two trillion galaxies. And we know that the Milky Way, the galaxy that we live in, has something like 200 billion stars. And they go, if most galaxies have the same number of stars as our galaxy, then we estimate 200 billion trillion stars. And the promise of God to Abraham was that if you could count them, that's how many descendants you, should, you would have. It would be impossible. We continue reading verse 7, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chaldees to give you this land to possess. Everybody say possess. That land to possess is the same land that the people of Israel are going in to possess the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. And so we understand that the first main point of the Exodus was all about God keeping His promise. He promised a couple of hundred years earlier to Abraham that his people, his descendants, his children from his very own flesh would possess the land that he was standing in in that moment. And if I know nothing about God, I know that he is a promise keeper. Sometimes his promises don't come as fast as we want them to. Sometimes the road to his promises is a lot bumpier than we wish that it would be. But God is a keeper of his promises. Just do me a favor. Just everybody close your eyes for just a second. What's your favorite promise from Scripture? Jesus, when he says, Lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe it's the the, the promise of God that says that I have a plan and a hope and a future for you, a plan for, for to, to bless you and not to harm you. I don't know what that verse is that's going through your head right now, but God is a keeper of his promises. It's in his nature. He can't not do what he says in his word. If he utters it, if it's written in Holy Scripture, he will accomplish that thing for you. And so the first main point of, of the Exodus is God literally keeping His promise. The beginning of the Exodus story was in Genesis with the promise to Abraham. Your people will possess this land. It's the opening chapter in the story that God is writing through Scripture. It's the hook. It's the thing that draws you in. It's the Bible's version of it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Well, a couple of people that read. It's the Bible's version of the pilot of your favorite TV show. It's God introducing what He's going to do in and through this people that he has chosen. He's writing a story. And the story begins with the promise your people will possess this land. And then it takes a left-hand turn. And the people start to wonder, is he ever going to show up? And then he shows up, and then it's 40 years of wandering back and forth and complaining and, 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 and being uh, 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 frustrated in and, and, and Moses. Uh, being frustrated with the people and, and Aaron making mistakes and Moses making mistakes. And all the while, God is writing a story. The story continues in Hebrews chapter 3. 
That's in the New Testament. It's the other end of the book. It'll be on the screen. Let's see what God continues to write in this story. Therefore, holy brothers, you who are sharing a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were being spoken of later. That's an important word. I don't know if you underline in your Bible, but maybe you should underline that. But Christ has been faithful over God's house as his son, and we are his house. Indeed, we hold f- if we hold fast our confidence and boasting in our hope. The Exodus was all about God's keeping his promise, and the Exodus was the opening prologue in a story that is still being written today. The story started in, in, in Genesis with Abraham. But the Exodus is like chapter 2. It it moves the story along. A a new character is introduced. A new problem is introduced. We've got the the promised land, and how are we going to go in, and how are we going to conquer it, and what is it going to look like? And often we read the story, and we get to the conclusion uh, of Joshua where they've come in and they've taken the promised land through, through, through war. They've conquered the promised land and the land is divided among all of the tribes of Israel. And we take a deep breath when we read that and we go, Yay, God, he did what he said he was going to do. And then we flip the page to the next story and we continue to read and we read that story. and We go, Yay, God, he did what he said he was going to do. And then we read about the kings and the prophets, both minor and major. And we read every book of the Bible or every story in these seemingly um, individualistic style. Does that make sense? I'm going to make a confession. Can I confess something to you today? I'm embarrassed and ashamed that I'm going to confess this in front of you today. Last night after I got home from the Young Life Banquet, my, my, the girls in my family uh, were sitting on the couch and they were watching Dancing with the Stars. And I sat down and watched it with them. And as we were going through, and here's the, here's the confession part. I already knew what all the I already knew what the contestants got because I'd read a story. There's this controversy going on right now about the scoring. And so then I walked in at the end of a dance that I didn't even see, and I said that deserves an eight. And Becky's like, "You didn't even see the dance," and I'm like, "Sweetheart, I dance well enough. I just know by how they finished." They deserve an eight. And guess what they got? Eights. Well, the next very dance that we watched, we were going through, and I had said something. I said it just seemed like a a clump of movements that weren't really connected. And Savannah's like, I don't need your critique. You don't even watch the show. Been home for 24 hours, and the sass is full back. I think sometimes we read Scripture like I watch Dancing with the Stars. It's a series of unconnected events, and we read them in isolation, but that's not what God is doing. Do you understand this? From Genesis 1-1 all the way through the end of Revelations, it's one story, and it's the story of a holy God redeeming a messed up people. Now, lest you think you're better than you are, look at the person next to you and say, you're the messed up people. Husbands and wives, be careful now. And the Exodus is just the opening prologue of that story. It's God just moving the story along. It's not meant to be read in isolation. It's meant to be read as a part of a larger story that God is writing. A story that starts then and is continuing now. The story didn't even finish when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. It's a story that he is continuing to write. Peter, writing to the New Testament believers, sums up everything that the Exodus was about. In in 1 Peter uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says this, but you, he's talking to believers, 
But remember, the story is connected, and so he's also talking about the, the people of Israel in the Exodus. It's all connected. It says this, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous night. And I'm going to pause it right here because we're going to read verse 10. But there are people in this room that are struggling with who am I? What am I supposed to do? What's the purpose of my life? I'm not sure I understand it all. This verse should be your life verse. You are a royal priest. You are chosen by God. He's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Not so you can live a great life and feel good about yourself, but so that you can proclaim his excellencies. If you're not doing that, you're missing the point. Not just missing the point. You're stealing glory from God, and woe to you if you do that. Your life is not yours to live for your own. Your life is to live to give glory to God and thank Him for what He's done for you. Don't be like the Israelites wandering around the desert complaining and grumbling about not having water. Verse 10. Once you were not my people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The third point of the Exodus was all about God making a people for his possession. The story that he's writing, he chose to use the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, led by Moses, ruled over by the, the king Saul, David, Solomon, and then all of the, the messed up kings that the prophets, and, and all of that, he chose to use those people. And here's what I know. Peter tells us that you are a part of the family of God. In that same chapter that we just read from earlier, he says that we come to him, a, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. He says, and he says this about you. He says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. You are a part of the family of God. You have We, we learn in Romans, I think it's 15, that we've been grafted into the house of Israel. But Paul tells us, and we're going to study this next year, uh, he says that in Christ there's neither male nor female. There's neither Greek nor Jew. Now, he's not saying that we don't lose our identity. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is the most important thing about our identity is that we're a follower of Jesus. That's what should unite us. Not that we check the same box at the poll in a couple of weeks, but that Jesus saved us all. And if I know anything about a good story, it's got a beginning, it's got a middle, and it's got a conclusion, right? The problem has to be solved. And in the greatest story ever told, that starts way back with Abraham and continues through Moses and, and Solomon and, and, and David and Saul and all the prophets like we've been talking about, I know this. The conclusion to the story of Exodus is that every person has their own personal exodus. Now, God's not saving you from slavery in Egypt and bringing you into a promised land flowing with milk and honey, but Paul describes it in Romans 6. Do you care if I read it really quickly? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by, by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You are a slave no longer. 
bought by the precious blood of Jesus. Verse 7, For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin for once and for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So that you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You, if you're a follower of Jesus, the worship team is going to come up and they're going to lead us in a song. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have had your own personal exodus. Mike, will you set this down real quick? You have had your own personal exodus. You have been set free from the sin that so easily entangled you before you knew Christ. You're a slave no longer. That's what Paul says in Romans 6. The problem is, some of you are still living like you're slaves. Put it down. Stop. Get rid of it. Don't let it grow. I saw a great quote this week. I can't remember who it's from or I give credit where credit is too. But it says this. It says, when sin springs up in your life, yank it out in that moment, lest you wait and delay and put it off and that little sprout of sin grows into a mighty tree of sin in your life. How then could you remove that tree from your life? The pain is much greater. You have to cut it down. You have to rip the roots up. The ground is disturbed more. It hurts more people around you. It's so much easier to pluck it out when it's small in your life. Don't waste the exodus that you have from sin in your life just because you feel comfortable where you are. God's not calling you to comfort. He's calling you to holiness. We're going to turn out the lights. And we're going to stand. And I don't know where you're at, but if you're in a place where you're living in comfort and you're not living in holiness, I would just invite you in this moment of worship that you would just surrender it to God. Just give it over to Him. Don't hold on to it any longer. Let's start the work of pulling that thing out of your life now.